Do you love spy books, movies, and TV? Then the Spyberry Podcast is for you. Hi everyone, my name is Shane Whaley. I'm host of the Spyberry Podcast, coming to you from Station V. I am thrilled, I am excited, I am honoured to introduce our guests for today's episode. We are kicking off Section F. That's our division for movies and spy films. Many of you have asked me, particularly last year when I was out on the road, can you cover more spy movies? And not just the classics, Tinker, Taylor, Spy Girl from the Call, etc. But maybe some of those uh, hidden gems that are out there that we're not familiar with. And that resonated with me because when I was in the UK, I picked up a DVD at Fops, great store in central London, and watched The Iron Curtain from 1949 set in Ottawa. Great movie, one I wasn't familiar with. So there's a whole universe of spy movies out there. And I've gone out and recruited, we talent spotted. I wanted to bring you movie aficionados, those who understand the writing, screenplays, production, all of that, that, all of that that goes into filmmaking, which I just don't. I just sit and I enjoy, or in some cases don't enjoy, a spy movie. We wanted to go a little bit deeper. So that's what you get today. The first episode, uh, Steve Lichtman. Sorry, I keep pronouncing it the German way, but I haven't worked on the German desk. You understand why. Sorry, Steve. Decided that he wanted to cover, he wanted the panel, Section F, to evaluate the third man. So without further ado, we'll cross over to Section F. Let us know what you think of The Third Man. Or is there something that the panelists said that you agree with strongly, disagree with strongly? Hey, it's movies, it's literature. The world would be a boring place if we all had the same views and ideas and uh, tastes. Come join us. We have one of the best online communities at Spybury. One of the friendliest places on the net. All sorts are in there. One thing with the, the common theme is we talk about spy movies, spy books, spy TV, spy history. Come join us at spybury.com forward slash community. Hey, this is Steve Lichman on a new version of Spybury, uh, Section F, uh, to talk about the spy films that we love, uh, acknowledge classics, maybe unjustly or unfairly neglected classics, uh, basically to, to celebrate the movies that we love and to uh, if you've seen them, maybe you want to go out and see them again and appreciate them more. If you haven't seen them, maybe you'll, you'll want to go out and, and watch them. Uh, we have a, an all-star lineup of people here to be talking about these movies today and, and as we go forward into the future. And I thought we would just begin by introducing ourselves. My name is, is Steve. I'm a TV writer in Los Angeles. Uh, I've written for some shows you've probably heard of, like The Good Wife in Medium and a bunch you've probably never heard of. And my most recent project is a television adaptation of uh, Declare, a supernatural spy thriller by the great Tim Powers. We also have with us uh, Jonathan Melville, Eric Newsom, and Michael Yui. Jonathan, do you want to do a quick introduction of yourself? Sure, yeah. Well, I'm based uh, in Edinburgh in Scotland, and I'm a, a film journalist and um, an author. I've written a few books on films, and most... And um, so I was going to say, most importantly, I'm a, I'm a film fan, really. I just love love watching films and not always analyzing them. So I think we'll do a bit of analysis, but also just enjoy talking about this film. Great. And if you could go back in time and be a part of any classic spy movie, which one would you want to be and which movie would it be and what role would you want to play? I think, oh, well, there's so many. I mean, I, I, as a Edinburgh, um, Sean Connery <laughs> is, of course, uh, the main man here. But... Yes. Uh, that's an obvious answer. So I think um, Austin Powers, <laughs> in uh, in the in the first Austin Powers movie, uh, just because it's so much fun, and he was obviously having a lot of fun. Excellent. And Michael Huey, where are you coming from, and what's your background? Yeah, I'm from North Carolina. I'm a um, I teach theater and acting at the university level. Um, I'm also a, a writer, a novelist. I have, I have two books that somebody actually wanted to publish. And both of them are um, early Cold War kind of spy thrillers uh, taking place like in, you know, right after World War II. So it's kind of perfect for third man. And uh, yeah, that's who I am. Well, if you were hosting an all night binge marathon of spy movies, what five or so movies would you screen and what snacks would you serve? Well, it just so happens I'm prepared for this question, Steve. Uh, <laughs> so I would choose uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Mm -hmm. I would choose. Um, um, 
the parody OSS 117 Cairo Nest of Spies. Mm -hmm. I would use uh, Tinker Taylor's Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy, the 2011 version with Gary the Ipcris file. And um, what snacks? Um, well, is, does, is bourbon a snack? <laughs> it has it has carbs in it, so I think I count. Yeah, as a oh, there we go. So, so carbs bourbon. equals snack. Excellent. And Eric Newsom, where are you logging in from? And tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I am teach here at the University of Central Missouri. I teach in the uh, digital media production program, uh, where among the many classes I teach is uh, film appreciation. And so I, you know, I'm a fan of film. I also have read many student papers analyzing films. Uh, I I love to have a good chat about films myself and, and lead the uh, student film discussion group here as well. Excellent. And if you could host a dinner party with any three characters from spy movies, who would you invite? Present company oh, excluded. That's a good one. Uh, you know, some of these, uh, uh, the first one that I was thinking of is one that I don't think many people think of as a spy movie, but it's uh, uh, Peter Falk as Vince Ricardo in The In-Laws, uh, <laughs> which I, I just find his, uh, uh, there, there's a line he says in that where someone looks at him, you know, it's Peter Falk, and they say, you, you don't really look like a spy. He's like, no, they're all built like me, stocky, muscular, short to the ground. Um, I would also, uh, uh, I know an, another controversial film, uh, uh, Carl Malden is Leo Newbigin in uh, Billion Dollar Brain. I know a lot of people aren't huge fans of that one. I personally uh, do enjoy it. Uh, and uh, and Milos uh, Colombo, uh, Chaim Topal from uh, For Your Eyes Only. I feel like that would be a really, uh, a really spirited party uh, if, if we could get all of them together. Excellent. And if I was... Uh directing the ultimate spy movie i was thinking who who would i want to cast in it what three actors and i think my protagonist would be richard burton from the spy who came in from the cold my his his my female lead would be florence Pugh, who i think is so incredible in the park chan uh, tv miniseries of the little drummer girl and as our, our antagonist i would want to cast philip seymour hoffman who is fantastic in the Mission Impossible movie, but also in A Most Wanted Man, just a, a, an amazing performance in what was his final performance. Well, our first episode uh, is going to be about one of the all-time greatest movies in the history of cinema, and in even uh, the most recent British Film Institute uh, survey of experts was determined to be the greatest movie in, in British uh, cinematic history, and that is Carol Reed's The Third Man. Uh, you know, one of the most celebrated and beloved movies in, in all of history, uh, released in 1949. So we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of, of this classic this year. Shot on location in Vienna in 1948, released in Britain in the U.S. in 1949. Written by Graham Greene, directed, as I mentioned, by Carol Reed, uh, produced by Alexander Korda and starring Joseph Cotton, Trevor Howard, Alita Valley, and of course, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme. It's uh, set amid the ruins of a divided and occupied post-war Vienna at the very dawn of the Cold War and tells the story of Holly Martins, a down-on-his-luck hack writer of pulp westerns like the Oklahoma Kid, who arrives in Vienna where his old school chum Harry Lyme has promised him a job. But he quickly learns that his old friend is dead, killed in a street accident outside his apartment. Soon after that, Holly learns that his friend wasn't the man that he thought he was, and he's determined, though, to learn the truth. He can't give up his image of his old school buddy. Uh, then he quickly learns that his friend's death may not have been accidental, that he may have been murdered, and that there was a mysterious third man at the scene of the death. Soon after that, he discovers his friend isn't even dead. Uh, the third man is a murder mystery that turns into a manhunt. And it is a fair and fun question that we'll get to later as to whether it's even a spy story at all. But first, Jonathan Melville. I'm you rewatched the third man for this discussion. What'd you think? Did it hold up? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love this film. When people ask me what my favorite film is, a lot of the time I will say the third man. Uh, but at the same time, I also love back to the future. Not so similar films, but uh, both, I think perfect films. Mm -hmm. uh, in their own way, and uh, and yeah, I mean, this film I, I can watch it. I've watched it so many times, and every time it's one of those films where you see something new every time, or you just pick up on a, a maybe a line reading differently, or uh, I don't know. You just um, I don't know. It's just it's one of those films that is just 
uh, it's it's I, I can't really think of many faults with it. So that's uh, either a good thing or a bad thing for this conversation because. Um, yeah. Well, it's an example yeah, of something it. that. What, what's an example of a shot, a line reading, a, a moment that you caught in your latest uh, rewatch of the the movie? That's a very good question. Um, uh, it's been a little while since I watched it last. I kind of, I, I've kind of, I do try and leave it a little while so that it's it's kind of fresh the next time. I think this time it was mainly some of the the shots. So I think there's a, there's a just there's a couple of, of of great shots. There's one, and there's going to be little spoilers, I guess, in this in this podcast, unfortunately, but. But I won't mention necessarily who the characters were in this scene. But there's a scene on a bridge when some characters all meet up, and the camera is very high up, looking down at them. And I just thought that was a fantastic shot. And it's not one that particularly, it's not the standout shot in the film, but it's just another one that adds to the to that idea. I think of people maybe being watched, and and this idea of this world, this city where where people are. Um, but I guess everybody's been watched in different ways, aren't they? And there's another beautiful shot when they they get to the wheel, and the camera just sort of looks up at the wheel as it's turn as it's spinning round. And and of course I've seen that shot every time, but it just didn't really, I didn't, it just didn't really stick in my mind. So this time I thought that was just a beautiful shot. <laughs> well, it's so also it more, it's, you know. That's also an example of how many great things in movie history are accidents. That that scene on the bridge was meant to be a scene on a bridge, but it was connecting to the Soviet sector of the city. And a couple of soldiers, uh, military police, decided to harass the film crew, and they didn't have much time to get the shot off. So they just stole that high shot from above to get down <laughs> before they had to get out of there. Because, uh, because uh, even though they had a permit, the, the soldiers on the ground weren't respecting it. So it was a, a happy accident. Uh, Michael Yui, how about you? Uh, yeah, it is. Is it, is it worthy of his place in the Pantheon? Yeah, yeah, more than worthy. It's pretty much a masterpiece. I mean, everything comes together. I mean, the scripts, the acting, the direction, the cinematography. But, I mean, every time I watch this movie, the thing that still sticks out to me is the score. I mean, yes. the zither that is used throughout is used so well and i was sitting here thinking it's so jaunty you know the zither itself but it feels like you know if if music hall if, there, if hell had a music hall the zither would be the instrument <laughs> you know for this for that music hall and the way that you know carol reed uses it to punctuate things there's a moment um i think it's in a bar and the the character popescu i believe the romanian mm -hmm. is talking about anna he's talking with holly martin's and he says, a woman like that should go careful in this town. And then he mm -hmm. says, everybody should go careful in this <laughs> town. And the zither comes in and it's just, you know, it, I mean, it's amazing that, you know, and again, I guess, I don't know how spoiler reverse we're being here, but that you can hold off your leading man for an hour of running time, essentially. You know, we're mm -hmm. all waiting. You know, we can all see. Orson Welles is on, you know, the, you know, he's, he was in the, you know, the credits. Um, There's a and, great article people can find on online. Uh, I think for the guardian, Martin Scorsese wrote an appreciation a couple of years ago of the third man. And he talked about the reveal of Harry Lyme in this movie as the greatest reveal in all of film history, because it goes back further than you realize. You know, there's a scene with Joseph Cotton and Alita Valley in her apartment. He's drunk trying to hit on her. And uh, the, the cat doesn't have any time for Joseph Cotton. And he makes a comment that the cat is, you know, very finicky. And she says, the cat only liked Harry. And then the cat kind of scoots out the window onto the street. And then eventually we're following the cat on the street where it finds a shoe in a doorway, which turns out to be Harry Lyme. But uh, so, yeah, masterful reveal of a character who's not, who's been talked about for an hour and 10 minutes until we, we first meet him. And then even then, we don't hear from him for a couple of minutes later. Um, uh, Eric Newsom, how about how about you? You, you? Is it still where it was the last time you watched it, in your yes. estimation? So I, I always say that The Third Man might not be the best film ever made. It might not be my favorite film. But I feel like it is the film that is best representative of a film, right? If aliens were to come down and say, what is film? I would show this to them because all of the different pieces work together so well. You've got that music. You've got the great cinematography that Jonathan talked about. You've got great characters. You've got it all sort of encapsulated in this nice little 
uh, this this perfect little story that begins and ends uh, with these framing pieces set at funerals. Uh, and so I, I just think that that there's not a single misstep along the way for me that that every little piece of it is is uh, you know perfectly placed. Uh, and and like Jonathan, there were, there are a number of things I noticed this time, and I've seen this movie so many times, but there's still new things uh, that I noticed. So you were you were talking about the cat just now, and I don't know why I've never pieced this together before, but there's uh, there's a shot where uh, where uh, Joseph Cotton is, as Holly is. Uh, dangling some strings from a package over the cat, trying to get and and has this sort of weird cutesy voice that he uses to get the cat, and the cat is having none of it, and that's what leads into this conversation about you know that the cat only liked Harry, and so when we see the cat outside later, and I, I think we've already spoiled, I think we're going to have to get yeah, into yeah, talking I, about that. I think that on scene. a movie seventy fifth anniversary, uh, you know, yeah, too late. Had a chance Should have seen it, it by yeah. now. <laughs> so the that famous scene right before that reveal where the cat is there at his feet the cat is playing with the strings of his shoe, right? And so there's this this nice sort of mirror to show uh, because a, a lot of what that scene leading up to the reveal is, is about how Holly would like to be Harry or he would like to fill that space that Harry has filled for Anna. And she and often he, calls him Harry by mistake yeah. and apologizes, not apologizes. Yeah, and, and he knows in that moment, like he's he's on the verge of leaving because there's no way that he can. And this is just another, just even the cat doesn't like him. Even the cat would prefer yeah. to play with Harry, who is not even interested in playing with it, right. than Holly, who is there. And a very, a very cat-like thing to do. But there, there's a lot of things like this. Is the first time I think I've noticed uh, uh, Crabbin's wife as a character, the cultural <laughs> ambassador, and how she I she think doesn't have being a very generous in describing her as his wife. <laughs> She, I she think doesn't she have a his lady single friend. line. Yeah, so <laughs> that, that may be it. But she doesn't have a single line in the movie. But every every time she was in the scene this time, I paid attention to her. And she, even without lines, is is a, a character that's that's realized there on screen. I just think that all of the uh, all the efforts are pulling in the same direction to just make this just like this perfect little encapsulation of what filmmaking can be and why it's effective. You know, one of the things that I, I, I caught on this watch, and I've watched this movie now like you many, many times, it's it's now breathing down the neck of Willy Wonka and It's a Wonderful Life for <laughs> movies that I've watched <laughs> more than, than any other. What struck me freshly watching it again now was how funny it is. It's a genuinely funny movie. I mean, Graham Greene is a comedic writer, of course, uh, but I just, you know, you're so caught up in the intrigue and the shades of gray and the suspense. I hadn't really appreciated just how how funny it was. And, and one thought I want to make sure I mentioned on about the, the Anton Karras's music on, on the zither, uh, which was not a plan, but when they were filming the movie, uh, they were going to nightclubs at night and one night Carol Reed saw this guy, heard this guy playing the zither and decided that sounds cool <laughs> and broke with tradition and had to fight to break with tradition to not have a traditional Hollywood type, big, big movie kind of score. But on the trailer for the Blu-ray, which is a beautiful 4K restoration from uh, Studio Canal, over Lionsgate in the U.S. and Studio Canal in Britain and elsewhere, they show the trailers from the original releases of the movie, and they're really promoting the, the, the score. And they say, Anton Karras, his zither will have you in a dither. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I yeah. feel like that, well, that zither's there from the very, the very start of the film, too. And it's not only that you hear it on the screen, but it's the... It's the first choice that they use to sort of graphically represent the movie. You've got this interesting sort of very modern geometry of the strings, but this very old world sounds coming through the soundtrack. And I think that that, along with the humor and the seriousness of the film that you, that you talked about, is one of the, the tensions that kind of sustains throughout. Yeah, I mean, we literally see the strings uh, vibrating and, and being mm -hmm. plucked and, and played over the opening opening uh, credits. Uh Talk, let's talk about the cinematography a little bit, the look and feel of the movie, which is which is you know famous for its what they call Dutch angles, the slightly tilted uh, angle of the camera. Um, obviously, it's trying to capture the disorientation of of Holly Martins in in, in this in the city. Uh, did that work for you? Is that, is that something that you think is uh, effective still, or what do you, what do you think, Michael? Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's um. I guess now we would sort of call it, you know, um, a lot of the lighting choices and very noir, you know, especially when we're in the tunnels, um, you know, towards the end of the movie. But, uh, I mean, it just makes Vienna such a character, you right. know, the, the lighting and the, 
like you said, sort of the, the tilted angles and, and, and some of the choices, the uh, overhead shots. And I mean, it's, um, I think that's, to me, we haven't gotten this far yet, but that's one of the things that makes it sort of a spy movie. Um, is, well, is let's go there. Let's go there. Let's talk, talk more about that. Well, Jonathan mentioned this when we were, before we started recording, you know, about the moral ambiguity of the script. Um, I mean, there are no spies in this movie that I, that I'm, that are mentioned directly as spies, you know, the, um, the word spy is used only once in the movie when, when Holly is on the street and he senses someone out there and he says, are you, what are you, some kind of spy? And, uh, and then we have the, the Harry reveal, but that is the, even the only time the word spy is used. So, yeah. Um, but it has such a spy vibe, doesn't it? So, and what, what, what does a spy vibe mean to you? Yeah. I mean, um, you can't trust anyone. Um, everyone has their own agenda and you're constantly questioning what is their agenda, you know, for a long time. I mean, I haven't watched it in 10 years before I rewatched it for this episode. And for a while, I was, you know, really questioning what's going on with, you know, Alita Valley's character, Anna, you know, until it's just so clear, you know, you know, when she's lying in bed wearing Harry Lyme's pajamas, which I love that touch, um, you know, where she's from. But all the other people, the, you know, even the way Carol Reed uses uh, the faces of, I assume, actual people from Vienna. I'm not, I don't know. Yes. Maybe yeah, there know. was a there was a there was a B unit that was capturing all these doc these faces that were real, and the balloon yeah. guy was real. <laughs> that was a real oh, balloon wow. guy. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that's that just kind of creates sort of you know I think that spy vibe. Jonathan, um, are you confident calling the third man a spy movie? Yeah, well that that's what Michael is is sort of suggesting. That before we started recording, we we had a bit of a chat, and we we were sort of saying I, I, when this was first suggested, I thought. Okay, is that is that a spy film? But in many ways, it's the ultimate spy film. Whilst mm, at the same time same not more. being a spy film, it's a, it's it's very odd. Well, I think as I'm, I I use those words, um, moral ambiguity, and I think that is something that uh, is 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 present in in many, if not all, spy the, of the best spy novels anyway and, and 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 films and i think those themes of uh of you know there's betrayal in there there's uh you know uh, it's a very cold war uh like film even though the cold war is i suppose not quite um you know it's it's the the dawn, the dawn of that and and so uh, yeah I, I and so yeah I, I'm, I'm repeating myself, I suppose, but I, I do think all those elements are there in the best spy um, fiction uh, and even in r real life spy stories. And, and of course, I think we'll maybe get into a little bit the, the what was going on behind the scenes, of course, when you start reading about that and the real world that was that was going on with um, Graham Greene. But we'll keeping it to the fiction that. side of it. Yeah, just, just to say, yeah, I, as, once again, I think it's the ultimate spy film, whilst not being a spy film at all, which I, I find very strange even saying, but <laughs> there we are. Do you agree with that, Eric? I, I think you could make a, an easier case for it being a, a, maybe not necessarily a spy film, uh, but I think that certainly uh, the first half of the film is a murder mystery. Uh, and then once we find out that the murder mystery is not actually a murder mystery at all, it shifts into a, a bit of a morality play. But the last, uh, the last segment of the film uh, is about um, you know, uh, uh, Major Calloway, uh, not Major Callahan, Major Calloway, uh, <laughs> running an operation on international soil, uh, operating uh, uh, Holly Martins in that moment in order to snare a, a black marketeer. And I think that uh, that definitely falls into that adjacent realm of of spy fiction here uh if it's not actually you know he, holly's not a secret agent in this case but but he is i think uh being operated in that moment when he's sitting at the the coffee shop waiting uh the bait that's waiting in the snare for for harry to be picked up um yeah you know and and as as today you know the the, the of course there are major connections between organized crime and intelligence services especially in russia and the former soviet union yeah. Uh, and in Harry Lyme, you know, he says he's safe. You know, he lives in the Soviet sector for one thing, and it's just the tunnels are a, a way to get in and out of the different sectors uh, uh, surreptitiously. And he says to Holly, I, "I'm safe in the Soviet sector as long as they can use me." 
And what are they using him for? They're using him for things that we think of as spy stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and he's an informant. He's 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 running uh, uh, black market goods. Uh, they're they're doing kidnappings, which are essential part of the Cold War. It's not part of uh, Third Man, but you know, the black marketeers like Harry Lime, the Benno Blum gang, was as an example. They were used to kidnap people out of the the Western sectors to take them back into the Soviet sector, whether they were scientists or whatever value they thought they had. So uh, it's it's. It's not explicitly a spy story in, in, in that sense, but certainly the, the, I would think the, the setting uh, and the implications are very much of a, of a spy. And uh, which I think maybe is a good time to turn to some of the behind the scenes of the, the making of the, the movie and what led to it and how, uh, as, as Jonathan was mentioning, there's a lot of interesting history uh, that I think will be especially interesting to Spybrary listeners because this is much like the John le Carré, Tinker Taylor universe, the third man seems to be unthinkable without the existence of Kim Philby in the world. This is very much a story that exists in the universe of Kim Philby, uh, which, which will be really interesting to talk about in a, uh, at, at some length, I think, because it helps, under, helps us understand uh, the movie better and the themes of the movie and, and, and why it even exists. Just to give a quick uh, background on that, Graham Greene uh, wrote this story. Uh, for Alexander Corda and Carol Reed. Graham Greene was uh, a spy. He worked in the SIS uh, during the war, and he worked directly for Kim Philby in Section 5. Uh, and they were very close, and they, and they were very good friends. And uh, what we now know is that Graham Greene resigned from the Secret Service uh, just before D-Day in, in the spring of 1944, even as Kim Philby was trying to give him a very important promotion uh, as as Kim Philby himself was about to get a, a big promotion. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jonathan, you, you, you've, you've helped us turn in this direction. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what you see as the Kim Philby uh, nature of this story or how he, how he underlines it? Un well, I suppose, are you sort of uh, alluding to the kind of third man aspect of it and the... Um... Uh, because of course he was known, uh, he became known as a third man, didn't he? Um, but uh, I probably not the 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 expert on that area though. Um, I think you were talking about this a few weeks ago. Maybe you could, but unless anyone else wants to to pick up on that one, but I'm not maybe the expert on that side of it. Michael or Eric, do you want to? chime in on uh, uh, Harry Lyme as a Kim Philby-like character uh, what? from what you know of Kim Philby and what you've seen of Harry Lyme? Yeah, so I think that there's a, uh, uh, to sort of talk more about how it plays into the, the theme of the movie, I think you can fill us in a little bit more on the, the biographical history of those things, but I think it's interesting uh, that a lot of the conflict in the movie, uh, m much of the conflict of the movie comes from Holly not being able to shed his previous concept of what Harry is when faced with the evidence of what Harry has become. And I imagine that that is uh, in part green uh, and a culture at large sort of working through that, that idea about, uh, about betrayal, about finding out that someone has this secret side to them that you don't know. I, I always think it's uh, fascinating uh, the ways in which, Holly, who has been this sort of cowboy character that he's trying to uh, live out the parts of his books. He's an American abroad trying to force this sort of noble concept of, of justice and, and heroism upon everybody he meets to almost everyone's detriment throughout the entire movie, right? Holly comes in and uh, in trying to do the right thing destroys every everything that everyone has set up. Um, but that uh, uh, because he has this this noble idea of things, the scene where Calloway uh, has to lay out the evidence before him becomes almost cartoonish, right? The level of the amount of evidence, the, the close up of the magnifying glass, the different slides that they're showing, uh, you feel like he's been there all day, still sort of steadfastly refusing to acknowledge that Harry Lyme is a villain, right? That in his mm -hmm. mind, he's the hero of the story. And now he's had that sort of taken out from beneath him and this man is now the villain and that's a that's a reckoning that's you know that's cognitive dissonance that you have to deal with this person that you've built up that you've put on a pedestal is actually despicable right and i think you probably see those as being um 
you know, a way of sort of narratively processing feelings that people are having about, about Philby specifically at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, would you sooner betray your country than betray your friend? <laughs> well, this is being recorded today. So I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. uh, but that is just between us. <laughs> yeah, good. Just between us. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, all, I'm really struck by the script and the scene between Harry Lyme and Holly. You know, in the uh, at the amusement park, where you know Harry justifies his actions by sort of you know um, bringing up you know, allied bombing and, and saying, you know, wouldn't you, if one of those dots down there stopped moving, would, uh, you know, and you profited by 20,000 pounds, would that matter to you? You know, and just, it's surprising. I guess, you know, I, I shouldn't be surprised by this because I watch a lot of, you know, older films, but it's surprising that in 1949, you know, we're having that kind of conversation in a major film like this. I will say real quickly and uh, about the Philby thing, I read an article that Philip Kerr, you know, the um, late Philip Kerr, who wrote the Burning Gunther novels, wrote about this movie on the Criterion website. And um, he said, and maybe Steve, you know more about this than I do, that um, they originally wanted to cast Cary Grant as Holly <laughs> and Noel Coward as Harry Lyon, <laughs> which with Noel Coward, that would be quite interesting. You know, I mean, obviously, there's the in Fleming connection there. Um but um it's hard uh, to imagine Alita Valley having a love to the death with with Noel Coward. <laughs> I don't know. Or is you that know, just I mean, me? <laughs> the one thing that, that Orson Welles brings that I mean, at least you know, when we've all read about Philby that Philby had is this incredible charm that even though yeah. he is a snake, he is so electric and so charismatic. And Wells definitely has that. There's a, one thing that's worth a... mentioning that people listening may know, Kim Philby real first name is Harold, Harold Adrian Russell Philby. So he is a Harry and even his initials are, you know, are including H-A-R. So there are some potential signals being sent there by, by Graham Greene. Uh, uh, what were you going to say, Eric? I was going to say that there's a line that, uh, uh, that Holly has just before he finds out that Harry is alive, where um, he and Anna are having a conversation about what it is that, that drew them to Harry. Um, and, void of having Harry there, he sounds like the worst possible person, right? All the <laughs> things that they're listing out about him are that are charming are about like, he, he knows how to get out of exams, he knows how to, you know, do these criminal activities and get away with them. You know, even later when they're having the the, the, the very tense discussion on the Ferris wheel car, uh, the thing that Holly brings up is you always knew the back way out of the gambling joint when the cops showed up. But you didn't ever share that with me, right? You had your exit route. But and so he's not a likable person even in their memories of him and even in the the wake of his what what they think is his death they don't have nice things to say about him <laughs> but he is charming and he he ends that conversation by saying i suppose he was uh, uh laughing at, at fools like us all along and then every almost every interaction that harry has with with holly for the rest of the film he is laughing at him right he has this, right. this smile but it's not it's not a cruel laugh that he, it's, there's a charm to it in that famous first shot that I'm, I'm sure we'll get to talking about. He has this little sort of smirking smile to the camera and he feels charming, right? There's mm -hmm. a reason why uh, when Orson Welles would go around the world after this to, to different European countries, they would chant Harry Lyme in the streets that he said that women were in love with Harry Lyme, that when they chose to, uh, you know, to adapt this into other forms, it wasn't Holly Martin's story that they told. They kept coming back right. to Harry Lyme over and over again and, and trying to sort of uh, re recuperate his image and make him into a, a more heroic figure. There is something inherently charming in Harry Lyme as a character. And I think that that's, that's magnified in the way that, that Orson Welles chooses to play him here. Jonathan, did you think at any point on the giant wheel when uh, Harry Lyme opens the door, did you think there was a decent chance he would try and throw Holly Martin's outside of that and have him splash onto the ground? Well, there's a, there is a, a really nice moment where um, Holly is looking out the window and uh, Harry's standing behind him. I can't remember exactly what he says to him, but you can, but that look in his face and then, and then Holly turns around and he, and the smile comes back. So Harry's got this sort of, yeah, that, that, what would you even call that? It's not evil. It's just that kind of, the, the other side of him. 
what's that other side of him that he doesn't want people to see and we see it and then and as I say, it's only for a few seconds and as i say then then holly turns around and the smiles back instantly and you just think that's a that's a lovely bit of acting uh and yes i think there is probably a moment where where <laughs> when he opens that door yeah. you think is he gonna push uh holly out of that that door make him one of those um, dots michael did you think that there was a chance that holly was gonna go flying outside of that car I think Orson Welles is definitely thinking about it. I mean, you know, he keeps repeating, you shouldn't have talked to the police. And he says that two or three times. So I think doing old that. Old man. So old man, old he man. says every, <laughs> every every sentence, every line. Yeah. Yeah. Like like Robert Shaw from Russia, you know, Red Grant. Um, yeah. Obviously, line came first. But yeah, I think the, or, Wells is, he's thinking about it as Harry. Yeah, for sure. I, th I I really enjoy that scene because of the uh, uh, we, we talked a little bit about the cinematography earlier and, and Jonathan had talked about that shot looking up sort of through the center of the Ferris wheel and you have all these like beautiful lines coming out from the center of the screen. It sort of matches an image that we've had earlier um, when Holly is running away from his uh, the the catastrophe of a speech that he's given uh, to the culture uh, club and he's running up those spiral stairs and we have a shot looking up at those. And, and it strikes me that a lot of the shots, including the one looking down at the bridge, we have a lot of shots of people looking down from balconies, um, kind of, uh, they use that height of the camera and then all the Dutch angles, uh, you know, those, those canted angles throughout the rest of the film to really emphasize part of the theme, which is the power from being, being at the top, but also the precarity that comes from being at the top as well. Right, mm -hmm. that even as uh, Harry is giving his speech about the dots on the ground, you know, would it, uh, you know, how how would you feel if any one of those dots just so suddenly stopped moving? He's offering in that moment to to make Holly one of those dots by pushing him out. And in that scene, uh, that scene actually starts. It's my, that I, you know, in as much as that image of the reveal of Harry is like one of the all time classic images, I think that this becomes the core of the film. We've had Holly, who's tried to be this hero, this cowboy, this entire movie, and the camera has never presented him in this way, right? We even have this great shot of him, speaking of, of high shots, where uh, Calloway looks out of the window at the police station at him waiting for Anna and says, he's been waiting there for you for a long time. And he's got his hands in his pockets. He's got this oversized coat on, and he looks like a small child just stomping around down there on the corner. We have not seen him look physically heroic once in the entire movie. And then there beside the Ferris wheel, and we've got these great swings that are beside of it too. We get this shot where the camera is beneath Holly, sorry, Holly, and uh, is looking up at Joseph Cotton and he looks heroic. And then we're expecting to see that, you know, that long shot of, of Harry walking where he's been very small. And then we're met with an equally heroic shot of Orson Welles. And so this scene becomes, uh, uh, in terms of the dialogue, in terms of the themes, uh, but also in terms of that cinematography, a duel between the morals of the two of them. And if you notice that the uh, the, the canting, the dutching of the angle of, of the camera in that scene uh, has a, a, a diegetic reason. It's there in the story, the, the Ferris wheel car, I guess you would call it, is moving. Um, but if you go back and watch that scene again, as the dialogue shifts between them, there are moments in which Holly has something to lord over Harry. Right, something that Harry has legitimate uh, reason to be in fear of, and in that moment, Harry goes down in the shot. Right, mm. and Holly rises above him, and we see this this sort of physical representation of this moral battle of dialogue that's going on between them that is fascinating. Uh, but then that we leave that, and and the camera becomes straight at the bottom, um, and so we're not quite sure where we're left with that. And there's one of the great moments of Orson Welles' acting in the movie, Without Words, is when he learns from Holly well into that scene that uh, the authorities know that he's alive. Mm -hmm. You could just see him deflate and all the kind of cockiness and diabolical, you know, eyebrow looks on his face all of a sudden fall away and you see a vulnerable, fearful face that he then very quickly covers up. But we see that. It's a, the, the other moment I would refer that to is when at the very end, again, uh, if you haven't seen it in 75 years, sorry for the spoiler, but when uh, he's, he's been shot already by, by the way, by Bernard Lee, who goes on to play M in the, in the Bond movies and is also the grandfather of the actor uh, Johnny Lee Miller. Uh, 
he sees Holly, who's taken the fall in Sergeant Payne's uh, Bernard Lee's gun, and he finds uh, uh, Lime on the, the staircase underneath one of the grates he was trying to escape from. And Wells just gives him the slight nod, which is his way of saying, just put me out of my misery. Just just shoot me. And then we look at Cotton, and then but then we cut away and we see Major Calloway as we hear the gunshot. So we don't know for sure exactly what happened. And certainly uh, Major Calloway knows even less than we do because he didn't know that uh, Cotton was holding the gun. But just one of the examples of just masterful acting uh, by Wells without even using words for such a normally otherwise verbal, if not verbose, actor. Uh, Jonathan, if you were trying to convince a friend who'd never seen The Third Man to watch them sit down and watch the movie with you, what would be your what would be your pitch? Your your pithy Ooh, pitch. My pithy pitch. <laughs> your elevator uh, pitch. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I would just probably say a lot of what we've been saying today, but 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 I think the the basic one is uh, you know this is one of my favorite films, one of my, you know the, the best films I've ever seen, and I want you to you know to to try and show you why, uh, but uh, but you know I think it's just um, it's the sort of film, of course, that we just don't make anymore. And I don't want to get into, you know, being talking about how, you know, if good, good, good films, new films versus old films, etc. But, uh, but I think it's the sort of film that uh, it's a complete one-off. It's so unique. Uh, you'll come away with something uh, that, that it, you'll always get something new from it. Um, I think what are some of the elements that you, to be honest, <laughs> you struggle. How about how about you, Michael? You have a a quick a quick pitch to get the uninitiated into the the cult of the third man. Um, a script by one of the greatest writers of the twentieth century, starring one of the greatest actors and filmmakers of the twentieth century. Um, but I forget who said it earlier. Um, it's the ultimate spy movie that's not really about spies. Uh, that's pretty intriguing. A little something for everybody. That's what I would use. I would use that one, actually. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Do you have any any uh, variations on that, Eric, that you might deploy? Well, I just think it's it's everybody working at, at their best possible output. I think this is Carol Reed's. Uh, for me, it's Carol Reed's best film. Uh, I think it's the film in which I, I enjoy Orson Welles' acting the most. I, I love Orson Welles across all of his many roles, uh, but this to me is is the one role that I associate him with, even over Citizen Kane. Uh, I think Robert Kasker as the cinematographer is doing some some great work here. Joseph Won the Cotton, Oscar for that. Yeah, for this movie. does indeed, and deservedly so. Uh, Joseph Cotton's doing exactly what's needed, and, and as Jonathan talks about, when they don't make movies like this anymore, I was looking at just the faces of some of the supporting actors. You know, we haven't talked about uh, Ernst Deutsch as uh, Baron Kurtz or uh, <laughs> Eric Ponto as, as Dr. Winkle. Uh, just the the ways in which, as you were talking about, Wells acting with his face, the looks that they give each other when they're at the funeral. Um, there's a scene where where Holly goes to visit Winkle in his home and Kurtz's dog is there. And there's this moment where everybody knows what's going on. Um, and they're having to just act without the dialogue of acknowledgement. I, I just think that they do such great jobs. All the character actors, uh, you know, the actor, I didn't write his name down, who plays the porter in this, Wilfred Hyde White as that, that Mr. Yes, Crabbe in this room, uh, ex expatriate. Uh, you know, the music is wonderful. Uh, everything about this movie is wonderful. And it's just people uh, from that golden age of cinema working at their best abilities. Right. I, I'm glad you, you, you called attention to Carol Reed because it's easy to overlook him. This is the third movie in a series of three that he made in the 1940s that I would think stand up to any three movies made in a row by any director in history. There's first Odd Man Out, which is kind of a spyish movie. It's James Mason as a an IRA member who's been in hiding for, uh, I think, a year or so, who has 20, basically uh, has 20, the final 24 hours in his life as he's being hunted by, I guess, the equivalent of MI5 in, or, or even MI5 itself in, in, in Ireland. Uh, then... The Fallen Idol, which he was based on the Graham Greene story they collaborated, which really is not a spy movie at all, except in the sense that everything is a spy movie because it's about a little kid who's watching the adult world and and then uh, making a very dangerous intervention into it. And then uh, the, the Third Man. I mean, just little decisions that he made that you can overlook and not realize how they uh, lead 
they they bring us into the world of Holly Martin's. Like the fact that none of the German in that movie is translated mm -hmm. for the for the viewer or for obviously Holly Martin's. Who obviously Holly Martin's would not have the benefit of subtitles, but in a typical movie, the viewer would. But it puts us more in his shoes yeah. that we don't know what they're saying. And the little things. That that great scene where the child is pointing at him and saying like that, that's the murderer. And he has no idea, right? That, that exactly. child that becomes so ominous in that scene for him. Exactly. So the, the Carol Reed, just a, a master at the absolute top of his game. Uh, but I, you know, I think while we well, all, most people would agree, Jonathan, that this is a movie is, is a one-off in so many ways. It's just its own thing. Uh, are there any other movies you'd want to recommend to our listeners who, uh, love the third man that uh, you think they would then want to uh, branch out and make sure they see as well to kind of get more of that, that, that feeling. Well, one, uh, I'll maybe mention one I just watched recently, actually uh, at Christmas, cause it was on, on the big screen. I happened to be uh, um, stormbound. Would you call it that? Not quite snowbound, but I was trapped in Inverness <laughs> over Christmas for a few days. And at the cinema, they had the spy in black. Um, right now, because I'm just remembering it, I can't quite the, the, the year that was brought out, maybe, I don't know if anyone else knows off the top of the head. I think it was sort of 1945 ish, six, seven, round right about that time. Um, Conrad Veidt, um, in the, the start starring role, uh, and just another little black and white. I mean, to say just a little film is to be, um, uh, you know, it deserves a lot more than that, but it's just a short, uh, contained spy film, really, with Conrad Veidt as this um, submarine captain who has to go to Orkney uh, and um, go go on to land. And I won't say too much more, but it's just this. It's 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 another one of these films with these amazing character actors, which I was going to um, back up Eric really on that one and just say all these amazing faces and characters that are in the third man. Uh, there's very similar similar sort of idea in in uh, the Spy in Black, and that just all these you know people maybe get just one line but are so memorable. Um, and I so think that's, that's currently streaming on Criterion for anyone mm -hmm. listening who subscribes to the Criterion channel. Michael, do you have any recommendations for lovers of the Third Man to? Yeah, take a, a couple. Chance on? Uh, there's a film called uh, Berlin Express. I think it's from 1948. Mm -hmm. Robert Ryan, Merle Oberon, and uh, it's directed by Jacques Turner. And it's um, about a uh, multinational group on a train from post-war Paris to post-war Berlin, Berlin. So you get these actual location shots in post-war Paris and post-war Berlin. Uh, Peacekeeper is killed on the express, and it sort of becomes a, a thriller. Um, another one I was going to recommend that's really I saw maybe a year ago or so is called Cornered, um, directed by Edward Dimitrik. And it's got hmm. Dick Powell. As a former, um, I think he's a Canadian airman from World War II whose wife was in the French Resistance, and he goes to South America to find the the uh, escaped Nazis who caused her death. So both of these have kind of that sort of post-war kind of, kind of everything is a mess sort of vibe. Um, the corner is a little more askew, a little more film noir than Spy, but um, but it definitely has you know that that sort of post-war malaise. And they both have, I would say, the, um, the, um, you know, where everyone is out to get what's what's in it for them that we find in the third man. Fantastic! That's a great recommendation. It's not one I've seen, but is one that I will see soon. Eric, how about you? I, I've got a, a handful here too. So I, I just wanted Let's to mention him. in passing the uh, uh, Carol Reed uh, following the third man did uh, the Man Between with uh, James Mason and Claire Bloom. Right. Uh, which is often thought of as a sort of lesser third man or his attempt to sort of uh, replicate the success of the third man. Uh, but I, I think it's a, a great, it's a, it feels like a smaller movie um, about the tensions between uh, uh, East and West Berlin following the war and also the sort of feeling of uh, dealing with the broken morality of, of Europe following the war. Um, and I think Shane yeah. Whaley would want to watch that because there's a lot of uh, on location footage in yes. Berlin after yes. the war. And I think it's pre pre wall footage too. So it's you know there's it's definitely pre wall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so uh, what else you have? 
The other one is that I would recommend from Carol Reed is Our Man in Havana, which uh, which reunites yes. him with Graham Greene, uh, has Alec Guinness in that that leading role, um, and, and also this this time has Noel Coward in 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 it instead of uh, right. uh, Orson Welles. Right. Uh, two films from Orson Welles that I would also recommend that aren't really spy films but are spy adjacent. The first is The Stranger, uh, which mm. is an earlier film noir that I, a lot of people say influenced Carol Reed's work on uh, The Third Man. Uh, it's about uh, Welles plays a an ex uh, Nazi war criminal who has made a home in this nice little idyllic con Connecticut town where he's married like the schoolmaster's daughter. Uh, and uh, Ed Edward G. Robinson comes to hunt him there. Um, and there's just uh, a, a great amount of just balancing secret identities and deceit. Uh, but it, it has a great uh, uh, ending where Wells is being pursued again through this shadowy, really richly geometric uh, uh, scenery. This time it's in a clock tower uh, by, by Edgar G. Robinson and Loretta Young in this as well. The other one that I would recommend from Wells is Mr. Arcaden, uh, yes. which is sort of him taking Citizen Kane and the third man uh, and the Harry Lime character and sort of smushing them together. And, and uh, that one actually came from a script that he had written for the lives of Harry Lime radio show where Wells continued his role as Harry Lyme. Yes, absolutely. The, the, the character was such a success, but obviously he, it didn't end well for him in The Third Man. So Wells did many uh, episodes of a radio series mm -hmm. over the years that were prequels to Harry Lyme. And yeah. he eventually combined some of those scripts into, in, into that, which is also available, I think, on Criterion. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of recommendations I would make uh, in film, uh, in addition to the ones that have been mentioned, is uh, a movie called Four in a Jeep which is uh, available and you can find it on YouTube. It's actually a pretty good movie, but you know, in the, in, as we see in the third man, the center of, of Vienna was, was run by all four of the powers and every, and was policed by all four of the powers. So whenever there was any kind of call, one policeman from each of the powers would go to the scene. And so whenever we see shots of a Jeep in the third man, there's four guys and one is British, one is American, one is French and, and one is Soviet. Um, that was a real thing. And a couple of years later, they made a movie called Foreign a Jeep. That is a is definitely a spy uh, thriller. It's about a, uh, a w American who breaks out of a Soviet prisoner of war camp and he's allegedly coming to Vienna to find his uh, his wife. And so they can be live happily ever after. And the four in a Jeep are assigned to uh, find him and, and recapture him. But the American especially tries to uh, help them when he learns what they're all about. And of course, the Soviet resists, uh, but it's it's a richer than that, and all the characters are nuanced. But especially interesting for the Third Man is it's co-directed and co-written by a woman named Elizabeth Montague, who was also part of the Third Man story. She uh, was a former spy, worked for the OSS in in Bern, Switzerland during the war, and then was hired by Alexander Korda as an advisor after the war. And she uh, was very crucial in the creation of the Third Man. She was the one who uh, initially took Graham Greene on a tour of v Vienna so he could do research for the movie. Um, that's how he discovered the penicillin racket and the sewers. She's a key player in The Third Man, and she's also a key player in the making of this movie, Four in a Jeep, which you can find somewhere on DVD, but it's definitely on YouTube. Um, I would also recommend a couple of books for, for Third Man lovers out there. The first one is a, a graphic novel called The Prague Coup, by, I think, a Belgian uh, writer named uh, Jean-Luc Fromental, which is a graphic novel about that trip that Graham Greene took to Vienna in early 1948, where Elizabeth Montague uh, showed him around the city and introduced him to various uh, people, shady and less shady. And the, 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 the conceit of this book is that Graham Greene was there not just to research the third man, but also to go on a spy mission of his own for SIS, because as actually did happen in real life, he had to get to Rome afterwards, but took a detour through Prague just before a communist coup in Prague in, in 1948. And this graphic novel kind of blows that out as a big fun story. Um, I would also recommend for people who are interested in the, in the, in the movie, a nonfiction book called In Search of the Third Man by a British uh, scholar named Charles Drazen, which is an excellent, really enjoyable book about the movie, uh, the making of the movie, the characters, the real life characters and, and the filby of it all. And one book I'd want to recommend, a novel, fiction, is by uh, Sarah Gainham, who we've, we've talked a lot about in the Spyberry universe, particularly for her earlier novels, which were explicitly spy thrillers. But she also wrote a book that was a huge uh, success in the late 60s called Night Falls on the City, which is a really big, sprawling, epic story about Vienna 
from the Anschluss, the eve of the Anschluss in 1938, through the war into the early post-war phase. So if you're if you're really digging the post-war Vienna uh, vibe, uh, that book is a great immersion in in that world and 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 uh, and the characters. And it's not explicitly a spy, but there are spy elements to the story, and it's just a really good a good read. Um, but one other last thing I wanted to mention that I had never really thought about before until I watched the movie again uh, for this podcast. I would like to, I should have answered this question uh, when, we were, when we were talking about what kind of marathon we might want to have uh, over a long night to watch a bunch of movies and have snacks. But I think now it would be really interesting to do a double feature of Casablanca and The Third Man, because they really seem to be bookends to me. Uh, you know, One is, is Humphrey Bogart plays a very cynical, disillusioned American who is inspired to uh, rejoin the fight against fascist evil, uh, inspired in no small part by a, a beautiful European woman, in Ingrid Bergman, uh, and it really struck me as how this is kind of a an inversion and a bookend to that story. We have Holly Martins, who is, if anything, a, a, a stupidly naive American filled with illusions, uh, who shows up in post in a post war Vienna. The, that is, is uh, if anything, going to lead to the stripping away of all of his illusions about uh, the world, let alone his friend. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, anyway, I think we're coming to the end of this uh, maiden voyage of Section F, the Spyberry uh, film podcast. Uh, Michael, Jonathan, Eric, uh, thank you. This has been tremendously fun for me because there's nothing I love to talk about more than spy stuff, especially spy movies and especially The Third Man. I want to give a thank you to Shane Whaley for making this possible and want to encourage all of you listening out there to leave comments on the webpage uh, over in the Facebook page at Spyberry and uh, send us suggestions for future episodes. There's 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 rumor out rumors out there that our, our next episode may be about the, the movie of uh, Funeral in Berlin, Len Dayton's Funeral in Berlin starring Michael Caine, uh, but we have not confirmed that with those in those in power, but that is what we're hearing on the on the wire. Um, thanks again very much, and uh, hope you everyone listening enjoyed the podcast.